Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another edition of uh, Beef, Bacon and Eggs on Islam for Europeans, where everyone else in the world is passed out or asleep. <laughs> and uh, I'm here today with an honored guest, um, Brother Abdullah Yusuf. Uh, Abdullah Yusuf is a Muslim author. Uh, his new book is fantastic. I am in the process of reading it right now. It is called Blood of the Levant. It is available on Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. Is that true, Abdullah? Yeah, yeah, just Amazon. Just Amazon, yeah. So uh, please do pick up pick up a copy. It's a wonderful read, especially uh, for young Muslim youth. Uh, but uh, it, and uh, just as a yeah, it is it is it is a bit graphic, but uh, you know nothing you can't handle. <laughs> but it's yeah. compared to everything else we see on uh, Netflix, uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's you know it's far uh, easier. It's far less controversial than what we see in a lot of uh, stuff we see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, while I was writing, I actually thought, you know what, maybe I've, I'm getting a little too much into the, you know, the the violence and war stuff. And then I, I, I published a book and then I realized, no, this is actually kind of tame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I wrote this over the past three years. And obviously, like, there, were, there was lots of gory stuff on, you know, your usual stream, streaming channels back then. But, you know, the amount of change that could occur from back then to now is just you know it's, it's, un it's unbelievable yeah i know and it just sounds, sounds like a speeding train that has that just has no brakes on it you know every year every, uh, netflix and uh prime video that just keeps getting more and more woke more and more violent like it's just uh, it's just incredible and i think there's a mm -hmm. huge backlash to that uh but uh, definitely this is this is definitely you know a good alternative so um for those who don't uh, know you very well, Abdullah, you know, we, we've uh, spoken before a lot on Twitter and also you're in uh, one of my videos uh, on Islam for Europeans. But just tell yes. us a little bit about yourself and, you know, like, uh, you know, how you came to be, uh, you know, uh, want to pursue a, a career in being an author. Yeah, so, Bismillah, um, my, my background actually has nothing to do with uh, literature or writing uh, my background is in engineering, actually. And my interest in writing, I'd say, well, I don't want to say lifelong because, you know, when I was when I was much younger, I had, a, you know, a, a variety of interests, you know, art being one of them. And still to this day, I I draw quite a bit. But when I was when I was much younger, I, I, used, I used to get into writing stories for quite a few years then. And then, and then I stopped and mostly my stories revolved around. Well, I tried. I tried writing horror stories. It did, it did not work out very well, mostly because I had no idea what could make something. You know, what how like how could you actually bring that emotion into a person? You know, while, while they're reading a book as opposed to seeing something visual. And I'm mainly a very visual person, hence why I think a lot of the people who've read my book they've said that they've loved how I describe things because I guess I know that it's one of those things that translates over when you go from art to writing, and. I'd say about three to four years ago, I was starting to get an idea for a kind of story that I wanted to tell, but I didn't th think I had the ability to actually put it into book form yet. And then one day I remember I was drawing and I, I just, I made this character and this, you know, this is, this is the character of Omar, the protagonist of Blood of the Levens. And I just sort of look into his eyes and I, 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 I sort of just got this little spark of, okay, you know, I could, this is something that I, actually, I could actually do. And I do market the book a lot as, you know, uh, alternative to a lot of what's being pushed out right now is Muslim representation. And, you know, I'm quite young, but even then, a few years ago when all this stuff started, I kind of, I kind of knew that, they, that it was going to end up going along the same path that a lot of other Hollywood was going. So I thought, you know, what, and, Along with pursuing these ideas and questions that I'm obsessed with as an artist and an author, why don't I also, you know, include in it um, really just my own spiritual upbringing, my own my own religious ideas, and just be honest about what I believe. And bringing all that together, I ended up with my book and the really really the outline for the next three the three books after it because you know I. Basically, I th any art that's made just just for the sake of obviously just representation, like uh, a lot of recent stuff, it's it's gonna end up being garbage. I think you need to be motivated by some 
deeper, you know, pre pre rational feeling if you're actually going to make something that's going to resonate with people. I've 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 always believed that when it comes to art. So yeah, that's really my goal when it comes to stuff like this. And obviously, I have a long way to go. I I I think the book is good. I've been told that by people that it's incredible for a first book, which I'm very grateful for. But um. Yeah, I, I I can't wait to to get along with this stuff, <laughs> basically. Yeah, you talk about Muslim uh, representation. That's a good point because um, there aren't many. Uh, in th- this book, uh, you know, delves into a little bit with science fiction. Um, but yeah, whole, yeah, it's a science yeah. fiction novel. Yeah, yeah. So there are some super supernatural elements in it, but at the same time, uh, you know, I was reading it. There's no. It doesn't conflict with Alpida anyway, you know, and uh, yeah, and that's I, yeah, that's that's what I and um, I don't know if you know Muin um, from uh, Safina Society. He, he works a lot with their with their podcasts. I've spoke I've spoken to him at length about this. He's a really intelligent guy. I asked him actually to go on my podcast. Um, he's he still has not given me a response yet. Uh, so I'm sure he's still thinking about it. Uh, Muin, please come on my podcast. But. I remember he, he one of the really big issues that bo- both of us were having with a lot of this stuff, like, for example, Miss Marvel was the most infamous example, was they'd bring in this, these science fiction ideas with with stuff like like magic and the existence of other deities, which, are, you know, are real and have powers. And, and they're supposed to exist in parallel to, you know, uh, the real world where. You know, there's Muslims. They believe in Allah and His Messenger. Yet, like, it's it's like, it, I, like I was, I was, I was play. Like, I remember I thought of this like really funny thing, and you know, I, I'm just, I'm just shocked that they didn't have the perversity to do this. Where you know, she's just wa- like a bunch of uh, Muslims in Miss Marvel just walking to the Masjid, and and there's like like some gigantic battle happening in the background in New York City. That's not a scene from the show, but like that, that's something I totally expected in this insanity, in this insane you know, setting and frame that they've set up. And I like just, just naturally, because I remember I, I started this book with, you know, Islamic ideas in mind. I didn't want to, you know, overstep any bounds like that. And, 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 and most of the time, this was not really a conscious decision. This was, I, this was in the back of my head, like, okay, I can do this. I, I, I cannot do this because this is obviously like, you know, this is science fiction. This is like fantasy magic stuff. And Muslims don't engage in that stuff. So my book would be considered, it wouldn't be considered fan, uh, science fiction and fantasy. It would be considered hard science fiction, which for people who don't know is the specific genre where the science fiction elements are derived from real things. Yeah, yeah as in for, and I don't want to spoil too much like, of the book, but a lot of the supernatural stuff that I bring out in my book can be justified to a lot of normies within that universe as you know miracles that just happen. Because they they can't justify it themselves, and there's and they're derived from biological things. They're not. I don't bring magic out of nowhere, and I don't create. You know, a lot of you know, a lot of you know, readers of Brendan Sanderson. They talk about like you know, making up your own like magic system stuff. Like I don't get into that. And you know, I think if you're a Muslim author, if you don't want to like, you know, go into that territory and actually write something that's, you know, that's not going to be corrupting in any way, you sh- you should be sticking to that like hard science fiction. Yeah, so would hard science fiction be something like um, Star Trek, where you know a lot of the uh, some of the yeah, things? Yeah, I would classify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Star Trek. It's like it's Star Trek was like speculation of where we could end up. Mm-hmm. In, right. in a way, like even though it was like really you know out, out of this world and fantastical, it still remained within the bounds of okay. If if we reach this point into into in technology and space exploration, you could see human beings doing this. Yeah, and in, so, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, in the same vein, I pretty much had in my book, that I, I pretty much thought, okay, if at some point in the turning of the 19th and 20th centuries, you had these r- ridiculously good and superior uh, civilization ending soldiers coming up out of nowhere, what would happen to them? And what would happen to them is they'd be used by uh, state militaries to engage in conquest, which is what the book is about. Well, yeah, a lot of it rings true today. I mean, uh, I mean, even though the, aside from the science fiction element, like um, you know, uh, if even I mean, advancements of technology are always going to be utilized by state power uh, to push their own agendas. Uh, but what was it a conscious decision? I mean, you probably I don't know if you thought about it. Like it is 
hard science fiction, but it also takes place in the past, which I, I also thought was really interesting. Did you yeah. do a lot of research uh, to, to make sure that uh, that there were no anachronisms in, in your novel, or did you like research into like uh, kind of like the historical yeah. part of it? Go ahead. It's interesting, and I probably should have put a note about this. I might do this for the second book where I clarify that the universe that I've that I've sort of um, set up for the book it has loads of similarities with real history. It's it's sort of it's because really the premise was I went I took a certain point from history around say ninth century, and then went okay what if this happened at this point and then all of history diverged from there instead. So there's a lot of similarities. Um, for example, there's a point in the book, which I'm not sure if you're going to get to, where I have my own take on what would happen in my universe if the Russian Revolution would happen there. So, you know, you know I'm, I'm not going to tell you what happens then. But yeah, like I, there's a lot of, you know, parallels between stuff that actually happens, stuff that happens in the book, except the differences in my book uh, due to a lot of the science fiction elements um, proliferating. Uh, there, instead of there being loads of these um, nations and city states, you end up with these two gigantic empires with a lot of these other countries as their vassals, and they're just fight. Just, they're just fighting for the territory in between them, at any over any cost necessary. And obviously, there's the the Iker or the, you know, this is like in in Dune. There's the spice in my book. There's the ore. So yeah. Uh, uh, is there a lot of authors? Okay, you said Dune. So, uh, what authors did you uh, draw from? I mean, what are your uh, you know favorite authors and you know what, the authors you took inspiration from? Uh, yeah, mo- yeah. Um, I, I remember I w- we were just talking about this before we started recording. Um, uh, I don't have that much of a big science science fiction background. Excuse me, like at all. Uh, most of the, the fiction that I, I read was like classics. So, you know, ancient Greek classics, uh, my favorite novel is The Count of Monte Cristo, which um, the, I, I'm not sure how much that inspired uh, the book. But yeah, it, I, I, I think it did in a way because I see it as the foundational revenge story. And my book has revenge is a gigantic theme in my story, in addition to a bunch of other things. And I, my, I'd say my favorite authors other than Dumas would be, I, I'd say Homer. Um, Dostoevsky, I'm just starting to get into him. I, I I recently read his novel Notes from Underground, which really it's like God sent me this novel. Like it just it just dropped into my hands at a certain point in my life where I needed it most. And uh, but that was actually after I wrote the book. But uh, while I was writing, I didn't read that many that much fiction. I I read a lot of not a lot of nonfiction experiences for my own research. For example, I read The Storm of Steel by Ernst Jünger, who was a uh, uh, I, in, in my opinion, one of the, the greatest men of World War I, who, uh, he was a German soldier who uh, wrote about his, about his experience. And, and in I'd say in contrast to a, a book like All Quiet on the Western Front, which everybody knows about, and almost no one knows about the Storm of Steel. And when you go into the Storm of Steel, you find out that this was not a, uh, a guy who was lamenting war uh, all throughout it. This was a guy who it had this kind of Spartan joy towards warfare and not in the sense of where he uh, was, it was, was psychotically making fun of the tragedies that were happening. There were so many points in the book where, and you know, this is something that really inspired me. And I think really, I think if you want to understand my novel at a deeper, le- deeper level, you should also, also read the storm of steel was that, you know, there are points where it, it, you get very emotional in, in spite of the fact that he's not, he, he seems like this guy who does not care that much about the reasons for the war or nationalism or any of that stuff. And he, and he, and you know, even though he was quite young, he wasn't like all those young guys who, and you see this in the all, all quiet on the Western front movie, you know, which was a, a very great movie where a bunch of like these kids, these 15, 16 year olds forged their papers and joined just because they wanted an adventure. But um, it showed you the reality of warfare as a, as a matter of fact thing without this um without dramatizing it and without I either making light of it as this big fantastical thing or as just lamenting it as this thing that's horrible throughout you know the, he, he, he even though one would argue that he had like the the, the terminator kind of attitude towards war, towards the trench warfare really i think he he had the balanced view and and when you, and when you read a lot of his later work as well you could you could see that 
came with along of, along with other authors like uh, Ernst von Solomon and Louis Ferdinand and Celine, who I've read a little bit of their stuff, but I haven't gotten too deep into them. It was the carnage of that war that radicalized them into the politics that they got into later. And, you know, there's a very big reason for that. So I think if you want, if you should, you should read a lot of literature from that era, you know, not just if you want, if you want to write stories yourself, but you really, if you want to understand a time where, let's say, life was, life was very interesting compared to how it is now, where it's, where, you know, I, a lot of us complain about the piss dry character of modern life, but yeah, it it really takes on a whole new perspective when you get into the to just just regular novels from back then, like notes from underground, just on its own. Even though it's literally about a guy who's just complaining in his room. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it was a different era back then, and you know, living in this this postmodern world where um, you know it's just all about it's almost like Brave New World uh, personified, where it's just about you know taking the next hit or the next drug or yeah. the next point of pleasure and then you know, you don't you, when you read books like this it takes you to another era and another time where you're just like wow people actually live like this how how could i have ever you know uh you know survived or or, or flourished in a time where you know violence was uh was, was all over the place and uh you know like um but you know you know sadly you know with what, what we see today in 2022 you know you know, it's the conflict is escalating uh, in Europe, mm-hmm. and it's actually the same two empires you talk about closely in your in your book, Europa and Russia. Yeah, I don't oh, know if I you could, knew yeah, about I, that or if it was just serendipity or. Uh, no, it ended, it ended up being a very wild coincidence. Uh, I remember when when that conflict first started, I was like, okay, this is it, I, I, my, our sales for my book are going to end up better because Russia is the enemy in my book as well. Who knows? I, I didn't, but. It's it's really funny, it, actually. Though I I'd wish if if that were a closer comparison, I think a true European elite who were worthy of their position would be more worthy of waging a war like that against the Russian Empire as as opposed to who we have today, which is a joke. And I, you know I don't want to get too deep into that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, so, um. Yeah, so I mean, Blood of the Levant. I've been reading it. You know, I'm really loving it. I'm really getting uh, immersed in Thank it. Uh, for you. those who don't see, okay, so this is the book. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Abdullah yes. Yusuf, Blood of the Levant. Um, you can classify it, I guess, as Muslim hard science fiction. I don't know if that's, yeah, that's sound about right. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, you know what? Um, I guess like. Um, there's just so many angles we can go off into with this because, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, you have Muslim schools and, you know, the curriculums that they, they do, I don't think they really include, uh, I mean, I know they include like, you know, we have like Islamic studies course, you know, mm-hmm. we, you know, they, they, you know, they, they read a lot of this Islamic literature in terms of that, but, you know, like, I don't think, uh, I've never, you know, I've never, you know, I've never taken them, you know, Muslim, I never, either taught or been a student in a Muslim school, but um, you don't really see uh, many Muslim fiction literature, you know, being discussed in those circles. I mean, do you think there's, do you think that there's something that they should do just to, you know, to have some sort of identification that, yeah, there's a, you know, a a Muslim author that's, you know, writing books and he's very successful. I mean, is that something that you want to inspire, you know, young Muslim youth with or like, or just in general, uh, what's your what's your message to the Muslim youth uh, when you write? When you write, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's a, a, a gigantic uh, um, load of unused potential with uh, young young Muslims when it comes to creative work. And today, I don't view it just as a form of entertainment per se. I see it more as a necessity because we we live in a, in a highly visual. You know, obviously, the world of the internet, the way it is exi- as it exists right now, everything is in the form of some media that's being thrown at people. And if you want to be a Muslim who's effective in, let's say, even if you're just not just a dai, but just someone who wants to the situation of your people to improve from a, you know, from a proselytizing or just like a propaganda standpoint, and you know, I can get into why this whole there's there's like this whole myth of around like why people think propaganda is bad. It, which is which is extremely weird and i have no idea how we've been psyoped into thinking this way but um yeah I, a lot of a lot of my writing 
I, it's not this it's not a direct call to action it's like hey you need to write your own fiction it's like i i do genuinely hope deep down that like it it, it gets guys who you know are you know are inclined in the same way that i am to be like hey maybe i can write my own novel too if this random guy on the internet can do it too but yeah absolutely be um what what else i mean really that that's like the main thing and you know not just that but there's a, there i, I want to say there's there's groups of muslims and you know we call them muslims but really with their behavior and the stuff that they produce you kind of see where they actually incline instead deep down who they are making you know muslim representing fiction out there in in the world and you know stuff stuff that's more you know slice of life you know it's not science fiction stuff it's not directed towards that young people that are say you know who are my target audience between 18 and 25 but the things that they're making really are not in agreement with the vast majority of us literally the whole point of them is to, to show white liberals like hey we're like you too and like that and to show off this extremely nihilistic um not just like it, it's 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 funny because like you know it's so lurid what like and you know let me just come out here and say it. like for example the latest season of the show rami came out um a few months ago i don't know if you know about it and uh, on nearly everyone in, who is even remotely involved in media creation in the muslim world when i speak to them and i ask them about the show they always just like roll their eyes like and almost like disgust like I, they can't believe the show exists and i, I remember I, and you know just to, to go off on this like slight tangent i saw the show in its first season many years ago when it first came out you know and i was hoping as a young guy who was just starting to get into writing i mean I, I believe it came out just when i was getting the idea for my book which was a really weird coincidence but then i watched it and i was obviously quite you know disappointed at how insanely lurid it was and just in just how ridiculous they just they wanted to take everything but i thought okay maybe they'll learn from this maybe they just needed a stepping stone to actually get their foot in the door to you know improve on things later afterwards because again they were making the show about an absolute degenerate anti-hero who was trying to find his way back to islam except they instead they just doubled down on the sexuality the the lurid um really just the demoralizing part of it and really i'm now convinced after this third season that this is what the point of the show is it's like it's like it's a demoralization show that's literally the whole point of it the point i i can't imagine a single muslim watching that show and being inspired like hey like i i, I this makes me want to be like a better person <laughs> it made, like when i was finished watching it i thought like you know, obviously I, I i watched the the, the second and third seasons with the sole intent of seeing where the state of you know top top shelf muslim media was at today that's getting all the budget like these guys are on hulu uh, you know the, like in you know if, if they had made the show on netflix it would have been of similar quality so I'm th so like and and at the end of season three i was i was just like th th there's just no way like th there's no way something like this is, exists and there were a few scenes there which were probably some of the absolute worst television i'd ever seen and not just from a quality standpoint but just the moral subtext was so horrible and like just borderline kufura that I, I i couldn't i just couldn't stand it and you know even though they tried to end it on a somewhat positive note of you know they, ugh, there's, it's not even worth getting into but uh yeah it, Another thing that I try with my fiction, and hopefully you're going to end up seeing that when you finish the book, is that I, th my main message always revolves around how to I, how do I bring the himma, the the uh, deep down ambitions of the character, back to Islam and back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Like how do how do we get back to that? Because you know you're going to see, and I'm I don't know if you got to that part yet, where you see that my that my protagonists and my characters aren't exactly perfect. They make mistakes, sometimes very bad mistakes, but there's, there has to be some kind of ongoing improvement. If there's no ongoing improvement, you're just so, showing the audience like, hey, you're watching this downward spiral for your own entertainment and it's not going to get anywhere better. And I don't I don't believe in stuff like that. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of fiction and some stuff that I read. You, know, it, you, you finish, you go to the end and it has this really dark message about, I, I guess, the reality of the world. But uh, sometimes it just gets so dark where you think, okay, maybe this is not reality. Like in in just to, to finish off to finish off this last point in Rami, like they try and shock you repeatedly with these scandalous things, which sometimes they're parodying things that have that have went viral in the Muslim community. Sometimes they just go off of 
very tangential things. But, you know, this is exactly why I think they lost 90% of their of their audience from season one, and it got replaced with just a bunch of non-Muslims who were enjoying the show instead, was, like, no Muslims can relate to this. Like, yeah, every so often, if you're involved in your Muslim community, you know, you'll hear about some scandalous stuff, and you'll, maybe you'll make a few mistakes yourself in your personal life, and you know some people who, uh, who finally engage in, in some of this in some of the things that they portray, but it just at some at, there there reaches a point. I think I think some point in the middle of the show where you're like, yeah, this, this isn't us. Like you, right now, you're it's you're literally just making fun of us. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think back to uh, you know the early two thousands uh, when we had Little Mosque on the Prairie, and uh, I don't know if you ever watched that show, Abdullah. I have not. Yeah. So, I mean, Little Mosque on the Prairie back then, like, um, you know, it was actually a pretty it was actually a pretty good show. And it was, um, you know, like you said, um, it didn't it, it portrayed, you know, Islam itself as a religion, a religion that, you know, that God wants us to follow. But still, it, it showed flawed characters. But the whole point of, you know, it wasn't that. The show never was never got to a point where it's like these characters are flawed, you know, presenting their flaws as like virtues, you know, so they still wanted to improve. They still wanted to become better Muslims. And when they, they did sin, you know, they 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 felt they genuinely felt bad about it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it was a lighthearted comedy that took place in uh, rural Saskatchewan. And uh, I look back just like, wow, like I miss the days of Little Mosque on the Prairie because, you know, back then, like Muslims were so ultra conservative that, you know, their qualms about Little Mosque on the Prairie. It wasn't about. Oh, you know, how are they portraying, you know, some white Canadians as not, you know, the epitome of evil, you know, their, yeah. their qualm with Little Mosque on the Prairie was, you know, uh, men and women are talking in the same room. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, 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 listen, like, this is what <laughs> angered me the most about shows like Rami is that they'll show the character do some absolutely horrendous things, which would traumatize any decent person for the rest of their lives. And he's just like, he just stands there like deadpan, like, oh, okay. And then like, they, they made, they do like a time skip. Like days later, like, like there's like, I don't, I don't even want to get into this. I think it's like way too graphic for your show, but like th- there was this really horrible scene, which ended with the death of his dog, you know, due to the, the, the extreme negligence that he had, which I swear, like, you know, if you cause the accidental death of an animal, that's not a major sin in Islam, you know, even, but you know, you'd feel guilty, right? You'd think so, <laughs> but, but they just like show him being sad for a few minutes and then he just goes back to business as usual, like not even like, a do- like, you know, we all know the a dodge, a dog is a man's best friend. But like, if you saw like the story of this dog and like what he's been through with, with the protagonist, you'd be like, how are you not like depressed forever over the death of this dog? Or how are you not at least like inspired a little bit to change your life after what you did? And instead, he, they just got this horrible like, oh, you know, I'm just going to move on. With my life. And he, he doesn't change a single thing. And he does this repeatedly throughout the show. And it, it's crazy because if you go and see who writes these episodes, it's every single one. It's written by Rami Youssef, the, the, the actor and the comedian behind it. It's always him and some other guy. And in season three, which was the most horrendous season, the worst season, I thought, OK, maybe like this is before. Like, you know, I had I, I had Hassan Dhan. I thought maybe he was being like driven in directions he didn't necessarily want it to be driven in by by bad actors in Hollywood or like maybe producers or, or people who were making comments on the stuff that he was writing. No, every single time it was him and another Muslim comedian who like had a, a, a large upbringing in the United States who were like, was born here, like second generation guys. So like, I'm, I'm, I was just so confused. I'm like, okay, this is weird. Cause in the first season, which wasn't as bad, even though it showed a lot of horrible stuff too. A lot of the episodes were co-written by, it was either Rami or someone else with like a white writer who was who was who wasn't that famous who had their kind of beginnings in some smaller shows so tell me how were those writers showing more respect for islam than you and your muslim friends like it's it's absolutely insane and you know like i i, I like i love the point you're making it's like you know you could watch a show like for, like like that for example which i haven't seen but i'm sure is really funny and I, i'd probably i'd probably laugh a lot when seeing it because it would be a relief from this from the stuff that i had to suffer from you know just to get some examples for the stuff i wanted to talk about hmm. but when really t- it's reached the point today where people where you people have been overinflated with this with not just the sexuality but just 
the horrendous, the violence, the horrible stuff that when you make a show like that, where it's, where it's just like, oh, you have a man and a woman in a room and they're talking and like you sort of try and make a comedy based off of that and you, and you try and like spark laughter out of something as simple as that, that's going to end up actually being very funny in comparison to something that people are just being beaten over the head with over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I highly recommend you watch this show. Uh, it's probably available somewhere. Um, it was very popular when I first converted to Islam. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like, um, you know, like the, it, it, you know, it was, um, it was very subversive uh, because, you know, you had the Muslims were a tiny minority in this small Saskatchewan town. And, uh, you know, they're trying to get, a, get along uh, with the townsfolk, but you also had converts, you had, you know, um, uh -huh people people in the town that had no problem with the muslims uh you know and you had like the uh anti-islam radio show host but he was still like a three-dimensional character and like you had these situations that were you know very funny it was a different time back then it wasn't this woke yeah. nonsense and i might you know just just to ask you like I'm, and i'm also guessing this is the this is the um kind of show where they don't keep trying to hammer you with a moral message and, and it's actually just entertaining, you know, for, yeah. it's at, for the sake of it. It's like it's meant it's it's entertainment, but it doesn't lie about being entertainment. It is, it's, it's not trying to shove something in your face. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, you, you know, there's like a, one example of an episode is, you know, the whole argument with this tiny Muslim community was should we uh, should we have a barrier between like the men and women section? <laughs> right. So this became like this huge debacle. Like you had like the conservative Pakistani uncle and his crew. They're just like, no, there needs to be a poor. Uh, and then they had, the, the, you know, the more like still practicing, but not like, you know, to the level like this progressive wokus leftists were just like, no, I mean, during the prophet's time, so awesome, there was no barrier, uh, which is the way yeah. the mosque was designed you know, when they originally made it. Uh, so at the end, they compromised. And they got like uh, these hockey boards, you know, the hockey boards from like an old arena. Yeah. <laughs> so you had like <laughs> the the window and everything. So, I mean, that, you know, it was almost, you know, it was very subversive because it was funny. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it's uh, dispelling a lot of misconceptions about the Muslim community without being super woke. Uh, yeah, which, which exactly. I found refreshing. It got the it, after a couple of the first couple of seasons, it kind of you know, the writing kind of got a little bit stale. It kind of became like, you know, uh, you know, a, a marriage story between like the imam and one of the sisters. So it was kind of yeah. turning like a friends type no, of thing. But the first couple of seasons were based. I loved it. Yeah. You know, it's funny because like, even though like, I'm, you know, I keep railing on the show, but you know, there were actually a quite a few episodes in the Rami where they actually did do something. They did, did do some good stuff, like a few, like there were only two episodes, which, you know, I, they were they were kind of horrible overall, but there was stuff in it which I thought was extremely funny. For example, they parodied the the typical Islamic convention, like the mass ikna, like they, they just parodied the whole thing. That that part like was extremely funny, I thought, and I I think that was good. I think they should do more of that. And there was another part where they actually showed you know they, they did a whole they did a whole episode about polygamy, and even though it was an action like the whole premise of it and all the like the character they sent it around was just it, like it was probably some of the worst television I'd, I'd ever seen they had a single character in it you know the show as like the the, the muslim uh like uh pakistani giga chad who had four wives like he literally just like it was it was some like pakistani guy in new jersey who had bought out like four like four like like literally all four houses on his on the block for each of his wives <laughs> there's literally a scene where um, you know, the character they're setting this, centering this around, he's considering polygamy for a very specific reason. Like, I like I don't want to get into why because it's so horrible, but like he, he he's seriously considering it for like an altruistic reason. And his friend recommends him to talk to this, this polygamous Chad, who who he knows from New from New Jersey from I think New York New, from New York actually, to talk to him and be like, okay, well, this is what it's gonna take if you're actually gonna have a second wife. And so, like, there, he's, he's, sitting, he's sitting there, he's talking to him, and, he, and like, he's and he, he takes him outside to speak to him for a bit, and he goes, "Hmm, which what, which like, which of my wife, which of my wives do I like, uh, like get to like speak to you to like actually like you know, you know, who's who's the wisest one? Like, who do I get to actually like, like, um, you know, like cut like consult with you basically?" And he ends up being, oh, you know, my, my of course my first wife is going to be the best choice for this, <laughs> and of course you know you get like the trope. There's this trope 
uh, with a lot of, you know, in a lot of ancient stories where um, big, like, you know, rich dudes or, or sultans who have multiple wives, the, the, the first and eldest one is usually the wisest who had, you know, and has this kind of like domain over the other wives that are, who are usually the younger and much sillier. And, you know, I, I saw the episode, I was like, you know what? Can I take like that specific writer, like the the guy who helped you write that episode? He should write more. He should write the whole season. Like he should not write. Like you should not have the other people on. Like I, I don't. I don't think they're ever going to learn. And it seems that like they're they're really trying to turn this into a sitcom type of thing, which I think is a horrible. Which I think is really is a horrible idea. I don't think that Muslims can fit within that format, mostly because it was created for a time when really sort of like straying away from the whole like oh single movie like one shot format of we're gonna tell a story and then here's the ending right here and it's just just be this long running thing where literally like this, this distraction form of entertainment where it's like oh every tuesday night it's like you're gonna you're gonna come after work and like watch this thing which i i, I really don't want muslim entertainment to ever veer in that direction <laughs> yeah i i it's tough for uh, you know um you know Muslims who are, you know, more traditional or, or you know, not, um, you know, brainwashed by the woke mob to sort of worm their way in and work within the system, uh, you know, to make changes. I mean, there's two schools of thought on that. I mean, one is that if you, if everyone thinks that way, you know, oh, don't be part of the, don't be part of the system, uh, you know, wala bara, you know, whatever, you know, you know, even when it yeah. comes to entering media, then the problem with that is, you know, Everyone, every Muslim who has any type of power, influence in media is going to be super, super, it's going to toe the line and, you know, be super woke. Yeah. And that's, be, yeah. Actually, no, continue. Sorry. Yeah. And then the other school of thought is, you know, you know, once you tr get into that system, it, 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 it almost like corrupts you, um, you know, but you see that not just with, with media, but Muslims entering all, you know, different types of spheres. Um, so how do you, what, what's your thoughts on that? You know, do you work within the system or do you, do you try to create your own? Yeah, you see, because this because here's what's interesting. Like, looking at it at a macro scale in terms of uh, <clears throat> seeing Muslims as a civilization, this is an extremely new thing for us. Because for the vast majority of our history, ever since the Muslims took uh, united the Arabian Peninsula, we've always been together. Like, we've always had our own institutions. We've always had our own thing going on. So we never felt the need to like. Like there, there was never any, there were never any Muslims, let's say in the, in the, I want to say like 15th, 16th century who were like, I'm going to go to Europe and like infiltrate their institutions that, that didn't exist. This is like a product of the modern world. And of course, as a result, we're delving into entirely new territory where Muslims are now a diaspora across the, the entire uh, first world. And we, we have to figure out how to navigate this stuff on our own without having institutional Muslim support behind us. Like it's, it's, it's a very terrifying thing to get into. And if you try describing this to someone, not just a thousand years ago, but let's just a hundred years ago, this would be absolutely horrendous for them. They think you'd be living in an absolute nightmare. Even though, even though you look at our situation today, you know, like I'm sitting with you, we're recording a podcast. I have my coffee next to me, you know, life is, you know, kind technically good, but then, they would also see it as a form of hell because, you know, we're kind of being subdued by these comforts of the first world where we're also, you know, trying to change things. And, you know, this is what you're, you're first tempted by when you go into these uh, institutions is that, you know, you, th there's a lot of talk about having to ha how, how to get in, in the first place and how to represent yourself and being a good, you know, ambassador and representative when it comes to uh, Islam and all these things. But uh, guess what? Uh, as much as they, as much, as much as there's like a gatekeeping and blockade to these institutions, once they see that you're a little bit different, you know, especially in today's climate, once they see that you're like you're an ethnic of some sort or a minority or whatever, they're gonna they're gonna try and like get you onto their side, like you know, like the, the same way a, a sultan tries to to get a uh, an alim on his payroll, like, hey, can you be my judge? Like they're, they're going to try to do that to you. So if you're like a Muslim filmmaker or a writer who gains any sort of notoriety and really this applies to any institution, they're going to look at you and be like, hey, do you want to like come with us? Because that way, you know, really, to be honest, like they don't say it outright, but everyone knows that this is what they're doing. They watch you on their payroll so you can't say anything. And I suspect that that's why a lot of different shows like Rami or Miss Marvel or um, 
a lot of the, uh, these other shows which, are, which have you know mainly Muslim characters in it, you know, which there aren't that many today, but they're going to start proliferating as the years go by. They they don't want to lose their contracts, let's say Netflix or Hulu or so on and so forth. You know, this is their first chance actually making it, and you know maybe their knee, maybe their knee is good when they go in. But then it qu- it's so quickly, it, like, it's so sad how quickly it just becomes corrupted once they actually get in, and you know, that those checks start to come in. And uh, which is funny, I'm saying that because, you know, I, I wouldn't mind working with a big, a big studio or working with, you know, non-Muslims to create things. But it's, it's just, you, there's, there's a certain political in- inclination you need to have, a kind of savvy you need to have when you go into this kind of stuff that the vast majority of Muslims that exist within these institutions now just just don't have at all. In fact, in fact, some of them are actually like really, they're not just captured. It's like they've been with the program from the start. It's extremely sad. Like a lot of these, a lot of them, I don't want to mention any names, but there's quite a few people who this applies to who they, they were born here, they grew up here. Um, and their story follows literally, literally the same as let's say you're any, um, Hollywood director who grew up in the Midwest, who was sick of the the rural um, conservative culture that they were in, they they moved to Los Angeles and they start making these horrible movies. <laughs> and it's it's like, and then you read the the biographies of some of these people. It's like, oh, you had the same exact upbringing and the same exact attitudes towards life, but you were Muslim. So now you just go in and you slap the label of Islam and you just wear everything you write. You sort of just put Islam on it as a skin suit. Meanwhile, that's 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 just none of the uh, none of the values that you're preaching are actually there. It's just it's it's, it's a really sad. It really shows up in 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 you know because in each episode of any of these shows, there's supposed there's supposed to be like a, a moral subtext. There's supposed to be a moral message at the end, like what you stamp your your episode with, like in which you you shouldn't be in the first place because your the whole goal is to tell a story, not to badger somebody with a moral message. But, you know, they, they, they stamp this, okay, this is how you should think badge onto whatever they're, they're making. And, and it's, it, it's, it's really, it's demoralizing really not just to the Muslims that watch it, but really the non-Muslims that watch it too. It's demoralizing for everyone. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, um, it just, and I think another angle to, to this whole thing is that, you know, in the world of social media, um, you know, everyone, because of, covid and you know everyone's working from home now there's no there's no real inner interaction anymore not that there's that that much interaction between muslims and non-muslims to begin with but i feel that now you know a lot of these muslim influences even if you know they're traditionalist muslims and they're dais or whatever Mm -hmm. uh you know like they still have to kind of interact in this world so a lot of them will will interview you know these established these establishment approved non-muslim figures thinking that, you know, it's going to be, you know, that it's going to be, you know, that it's going to be fruitful, or maybe we'll get to the convert to Islam. And, you know, I just look at this, I'm just like, wow, like the average, average person, like you take your average, like small town community, have probably never even heard of these figures. So yeah, on one extreme, you have, you know, the woke, progressivist, liberal type Muslims, who are like, don't engage with these conversations at all, which I don't agree with. I mean, there's utility in it because you're reaching thousands of non-Muslims who watch their show. And even if they don't agree with uh, these establishment figures on things like foreign policy, you're still, it's still a teaching moment and you're still getting your message across. So that's one extreme. And then on the other extreme, you have Muslims who are just like, oh, you know, well, you know, they were trying to, you know, the, they were trying to grift uh, anyway. And, you know, they tried to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, they, they prove treacherous, just like all non-Muslims. And I just think it's just so fake. Like, even if you're not, you know, like having these, you know, join, quote unquote, joining like these non-Muslim organizations, <clears throat> even when you engage with it, it's just so, um, you know, it's almost like you're, you're trying to like, uh, trying to like, you know, go into the castle just by running into a wall instead of like, you know, trying to find a back door and talk to actual people. I, do you feel mm-hmm. that kind of fakeness when you see like, for example, like the Muhammad hijab, Jordan Peterson interview and, you know, what had the debacle, what happened then? Or I mean, what do you see get kind of the same thing? Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure I would use that as an example. I, I think Muhammad hijab, I think he, uh, I think he has noble intentions when it I comes think to so. stuff like that. Yeah. But <laughs> obviously like there reaches a point where, 
you know, um, a lot of my a lot of my friends who actually, funnily enough, they're not Muslim. Um, we I spoke with them about this, and I've seen them talk about this. There's there's a thing such as a moral floor where once once a certain figure or someone gets past that, like you're done with them. Like that's it. You can't justify anything they're doing any longer. Like. Like remember, like Muhammad Hijab, like I think this is, like, for example, this is a sign. Like I think one of the one of the signs that he has great, uh, noble intentions. He did not bring he did not bring on Tate until he he had cleaned his act, cleaned up his act. Like he did not bring him on when, when he during the summer when everyone wanted to bring him on. You know, everyone wanted him on his podcast because you know he was the guy. But you know, when, once he you know he accepted Islam, he became one of us. Then Muhammad Hijab was like, okay, great. Like, you know, like, it was just funny. I think he wanted to interview him before, but he, they'd been speaking before. I think he'd been, he'd been Muslim for a while, basically. So, you know, that was, that was like the opposite example. But, you know, I think, I think that there is a way to do it. I, I don't like the word grifter. I, 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 I don't enjoy that at all. Like, because uh, you, you look throughout Muslim history, it's like, even the Sahaba, like during the Rashidun Kafi, they had stipends. Yeah. They, they deserved to be compensated for the work they were doing. And, and then later on in the Umayyad period, the scholars who were doing genuine Islamic work, they were very poor people. And, you know, they had to keep up day jobs to be able to, you know, continue their scholarship without starving. And then I forgot which Khalifa that did this. Um, I think it was Walid ibn Abd al-Malik who, uh, who opened up these massive grants to the, to these scholars or to anyone that was studying Islam that made it so that these guys did not have to work. In order to do what they loved, and that just it, that just it, it allowed Muslim scholarship to flourish in a way that had not yet been uh, it was not yet able to in that form. So, look, really, like, are you what, what you, you you're gonna call like those for guys, for example, grifters, just because they wanted to be paid for what they were doing? It's like uh, any artist I've spoken to, every, the primary reason they wanted to be paid for their work is so that they they're able to do more of their work, right? You know, and that's how it is for most guys starting out. The problem, however, is when you get into like the much bigger spheres, it's like, oh, who's paying you and what are they paying you to do? But, and like, and you, you, and, you know, you, you see the contrary example when some guys just they absolutely quit and they just go, they burn their bridges and you just leave the organization that they're in because they refuse to be goaded or paid into doing something that they don't want to do, which is obviously an, an, ex, an extremely like, it's a very drastic move on the part of the artist because you know you're risking your entire career. But guess what? It actually turns out very well for a lot of them because they go out, they make a big public show of it, and then they end up they set up their own independent pro- platforms and everyone just supports them there instead of you know where they were. And I think that's the real mark of an artist. Like if you're if you're an artist who or a writer who's actually worth their weight in gold, then when you when you leave after being goaded into doing things that are let's say not anti-Islamic or just like not 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 where your heart is leaning as a Muslim. If you leave and then everyone that was your fan and that was a fan of your work just flocks to you, then that's proof that you were, that you were, actually, that you were actually worth what you were making. As opposed to like guys who, who get like, let's say just kick, get kicked off like wherever they were because, you know, they just, they, they were too cowardly to like actually, you know, do what they were supposed to do. And then the, everyone just forgets about them because it turns out that whatever prestige they had was attached to the organization as opposed to, you know, whatever big work that they were actually doing. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. And, uh, you know, I, I have no problem with Mohammed's job. I think, uh, you know, his interviews with, uh, with Jordan Peterson, with Andrew Tate, like, you know, like he, you know, ha- kept in mind that, you know, like, you know, the, 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 the main goal, yes, you're talking to this person and you want them to be, whether they're already Muslim and you want them to stay on the straight path or whether they're not Muslim and you want them sincerely to convert at the same time, you know, the, the main goal is you're trying to represent Islam and you're trying to present it uh, as a, as a way of life uh, that, that, that anyone watching can follow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> His answer, uh, Jordan Peterson's answer when he was asked about the Mus- the dear Muslims video. I don't know if you saw that. When he when he invited yeah, I did, Dr. I did watch when he invited Dr. Peterson and uh, <laughs> Jonathan Paggio to, to the masjid, that was horrendous. I don't even know how he accepted that because I remember like I remember I, like I was I was watching it and, and you know he asked me about it. I was like, oh, you know, why do you think there was so much backlash to that video? 
And he just gave like, the most, the worst word salad. You can't even call it a word salad because no one would eat that. Ch- you know, I don't, I, I don't want to curse, but <laughs> you know, this, I know this is a slam program, but like, how could I, it's like after, after that point, I, I hope Muhammad Hijab learned his lesson that he's not going to invite him back onto the show after that. But really like, this is like one of those examples where it's like, okay, he outlived his usefulness as like one of those non-Muslim characters you can show to Muslims and be like, hey, here's an example of good scholarship from the West who, you know, we can, who shares some ideas similar to what we've been talking about. Like, like, I think after those first couple of shows they did with him, I think that was it. Like, you should never buy him on again. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and after that, yeah, I think I think anyone who uh, like really, I think I encourage all of anyone that that watches this to go and watch that clip. Just the first ten minutes, it's time stamped. Go, like, watch that and see why. Like, th- there's just some people which we should who should, we should just stop engaging with after a while because they've they've just proved that they're beyond what we expected them to be. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I know it couldn't have gotten any worse. And uh, you know, I just despise the fact that uh, Jordan Peterson is somehow you know, this official represent representation of like uh, Westerners and their thoughts on Islam. I mean, like it's, yeah. there are many Westerners I know who have positive images towards Islam. There's so many people you could have picked instead of this established and approved guy who really looks like he has like a laser pointed at his head at all times. You know, like there's, yeah. <laughs> you know, anyone, I don't, I mean, like this guy's an exclusive contract from Daily Wire Plus. I mean, like, you know, like he. Yeah. He, and uh, it's, I don't think, because <clears throat> because him merely talking about stuff like masculinity and like how boys need to become men and how like this this insane mainstream bashing of the of mascul of masculinity and men how that should stop he he's like he's not this like big macho guy like he's like he, like you know you look at him he's like this like skinny like older like Canadian who sounds like Kermit the Frog you'd expect someone like him to be very approachable. And very like, you know, people would be receptive to his message because he'd put it in a way which is very soft. And, you know, he does put it in a very soft way when he talks about a lot of these very, you know, important topics. But it's just so funny that just even a guy like him with that lilting voice, when he talks about stuff like that, he gets brought like he he gets made into like this this fascist right wing Nazi who, uh, you know, I remember he talked about like, oh, uh, oh, Hitler was obsessed with cleanliness. So, you know, and the, like in that whole like thing he went off on, that was an appeal to liberals. But just because he was on like this, the, the, the side of, you know, um, not everything has to be a post-1948 uh, f- uh, feminization psyop, the, he was destroyed. Yeah. And, you know, instead of that radicalizing him into, let's say, being more inclined towards our side and being like, okay, maybe we should just not appeal to these people at all and never be like, okay, oh, I'm on the center. I'm not exactly right wing or left wing. No, instead, he just like got even more like, it's almost like th- they succeeded in buck breaking him and making him into an effeminate guy that was on their side, except instead of being on their side, he just ended up being a Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, a uh, Zionist character who has dinner with Netanyahu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, when you think about it, makes a lot of sense. Like this is what happens to every big right wing figure that gets buck broken. They end up going to the Daily Wire. That's, yeah. that's, that's all that happens to them. They end up, they end up being friends with Ben Shapiro. Yeah. Or if they stick to their principles, they get the platform, and you, you never hear from them again. You know, you huh? have to find them on <laughs> Odyssey or or Bit Shoot, and any Muslim that even tries to engage with them, you know, is going to get their life ruined. Yep. So, you know, and, you know, that's what's the frustrating thing is because <clears throat> for Muslims who don't interact with the Anglosphere that much, if all I, if the only white people I ever saw, if I was in that community, if the only white people I ever saw was Donald Trump and Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, like I would, I would despise white people too, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that was something that I, I, I that my book kind of engage, engages with in an indirect way. Like in a very indirect way, like it's, it's kind of hidden. And like, I don't think I'm going to get too much deeper into this until way later, but much of like the, the historical and like, you not just historical. Cause I, I didn't approach this as a historian. I approach this as an artist who's very interested in human things, which is, excuse me. Yeah. The, uh, the coffee is just, uh, <laughs> 
had a bit of an effect on me. I I I I have it with a lot of milk and sugar, uh, Ray Pete style. But anyway, you know, um, what was I getting on? You know, I don't, I don't, I didn't approach this from a historian's perspective. You know, just to give a little bit, bit of background. At the end of the Bronze Age, like, like, uh, however many, uh, like thousands of years ago, you know, I, I'd say, I think around twelve hundred BC. There. The, the prominent form of warfare was the chariot. If you had any kind of civilization, the only way that could be maintained in an era of, ma of mass piracy and uh, a war warring bandits, and if you wanted any kind of security or the semblance of a civilization in a kingdom, you needed to have chariots because chariots had dominated the region over the past hundreds, for over hundreds of years. You know, Indo Indo European invasions, coming of the Greeks, all that stuff. And but it had become this system which be had become so fragile and interdependent on so many different factors that it became so easy for really just a certain kind of man and a certain kind of warrior to get with his friends and just destroy the entire thing. And really, that's what happened. Because, like, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been in proximity to a horse, but like, have you ever, have you ever, I don't know if you've ever had a, a horse running at you? It's an extremely horrifying experience. So, like, imagine like four of those and a guy on a chariot shooting arrows at you. It's like it's like it's it's unimaginable from for ninety nine point nine percent of people today. They can't they can't pot, like imagine an army of those things, which is a million times worse coming at you. Yet during that time, around like twelve hundred BC, there there was over the next 70, 80 years, there was this certain these certain kinds of warriors. You know, they call them the Sea Peoples, and you know. Um, if you want a much deeper look in this, you can read Robert Drew's um, The End of the Bronze Age, where they had the courage with their spears and their shields. And, you know, this is, this is how the hoplites, the in ancient priests, how they fought. And they thought, OK, you know, they took these weapons, which had been around for a very long time. And they thought, you know what, what would happen if we cornered the chariots? You know, literally jumping at the chariots with our sword, with our with our spears and swords, and just took them down. That one little idea that came in the heads of these kinds, of, this, these kinds of civilization and warriors, was enough for them within a period of less than a century to topple the, all of these all of these empires, which were just which were really the only known bit of civilization at the time. And just they they took over for themselves, and they and all of their treasures were just left to them, and the and, and just it changed the entire world and it changed not just the form of warfare, but everything. Now, any, uh, any autist historian is going to read that and think, Oh, very interesting. And just sort of mark it down and then look at all the other factors, like the environmental factors, the earthquakes, whatever. But no, you have, you have to realize like, and this is something that I was extremely interested in as well. Like what, what, what does it take for a man to, to do something like that? And in my book, a lot of my exploration with the Iker hearts, you know, the main, you know, super powered guys in the story was they represent something like this, the civilization ending warrior, I, either the charioteer or the uh, the guy who stands up to the charioteer with his friends, who is looking around at a world that's changing. And, you know, right in, in, in the era that the reader is going in, into in my book, is so, they're sort of looking around in this, this huge advancement of technology because these, em these different countries had banded together and formed this one big empire where they're sort of outliving their usefulness too. Because they used to be the civilization and the warrior, and now they're they're being over overburdened by this technology. And so, and, and and deep down, it's like it's a very masculine thing to like to to realize that you're being outlived of your usefulness and think, okay, I'm going to live on in spite of that. And you know, we and I, you know, we live in these in these really dark times already, you know, social, socially and culturally. But you can you can still perform great works in spite of that. Like you look at our greatest uh, Muslim scholars, they all lived in times where the Muslims were losing their prominence. Ibn Daymiya, you know, and I know a lot of people have big problems with him, but remember, he was born, I think, five or six years after the sack of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. So he was like, he was growing up during one of the absolute worst times in human history for the Muslims. When, when, when there was no kind of, Civil, there was no kind of civilizational security that you had, for example, with the Rashidun Caliphate or the Umayyads, where we thought, okay, these aren't united Muslim lands, we don't have outsiders. 
but as opposed to his time where all the rule was given to the sultans and the military leaders and there were crusaders at one end and mongols on the other end so you know this is something that i really like this is this is a really background idea in my book of you know how do you deal with that as a man how do you live on in these dark times where you know you're uh you're trying to make your way in a world that can't recognize you anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh and that's very inspiring uh, uh abdullah and hopefully more muslim uh more muslim youth uh, will, will you know like look at the world that's that's around them and be able to figure out what exactly uh, the issues are and uh, propose new solutions uh, to you know the, the the new challenges that are unprecedented um, both in the Muslim world and in, in the Western world. Yeah. Uh, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa taala like help us in that endeavor. And um, you know that that's that's the that's you know that's uh, something to keep in mind. You know when you're you know when you're writing your books, your wonderful books. Uh, just for thank just you, to yes. give another plug, Blood of the Levant by Abdullah Yusuf, uh, Muslim hard science fiction. Uh, please order your copy today from Amazon. Um, he's also going to be. This is actually going to be a tetralogy, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Abdullah? Yes. Yep. Okay. So he's going to write three other books with this. Uh, you know, great for for Muslim adolescents, and that's also what we're doing here at Islam for Europeans. You know, like. We see, we can see, we're trying to see the bigger picture and where the problems are in the Dawah and, you know, the broken relationship between Islam and the West and, uh, you know, proposing the solution. We, alhamdulillah, have the ability to broadcast to the entire world now. And, you know, we're kind of using the system against it, you know, like um, it's almost like playing against someone with a very fast tennis serve and, you know, using their speed against them. Uh, you know, and the, that's, that's the, that's the cool thing. And I, even though we're living in this age where, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to survive as a Muslim, uh, you know, like, um, you still, we still have the ability uh, to make positive changes. So, you know, like this could be implemented in, in masjids uh, across the West, but uh, any parting remarks, uh, Abdullah, it was wonderful uh, talking to you again. Uh, any thing you'd like to plug? Um, other than my book, not really. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, a lot of I'm sure anyone that watches would be would be coming from my Twitter, so I don't think there's any use plugging that either. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I also write on Substack. Um, it's it's just, it's just Avdala Substack. You should you should find it pretty easily. Okay. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it was a great discussion. I I really enjoyed talking about a lot of the background ideas for my book. I think this is one of the this is one of the first shows where I actually got to do that at depth. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. No problem. No problem. I'm Robert from Islam for Europeans. Uh, please like and subscribe. And yes. uh, please buy uh, Abdul Yusuf's book, Blood of the Levant. And uh, as -salam wa that's it for today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, keep us on the straight path. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah wa rabbil alameen. as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I'm going to end the stream now. Okay. All right. That's it. Can you see? Right. Wonderful. Okay.